session provides us an opportunity to really put a capstone on what was a full and engaging first day of discussion of the data-driven uh, economy. My name is Paul Taylor. I serve with Governing Magazine and the Governing Institute, and we'd like to extend my thanks to the public poli the, uh, the Institute for its invitation uh, to be here, as well as our host institution here at uh, John Cabot University. Want to, uh, as we begin this conversation about the responsibility of corporations in uh, the evolution and development of the big data economy and the stewardship responsibilities that come with that, introduce uh, our panelists that uh, are, are with us and one who is on route, uh, which just adds that much level of excitement to the proceedings. Uh, we're joined uh, here by Laurel, uh, Laurel Fennell, the uh, general counsel into it. And to say general counsel is to ignore the fact she's got many specific obligations within the company, both operations and policy, that would probably be outside the scope of most general counsels. We'll, we'll hear from her about uh, those and other responsibilities that she has in making these considerations around big data um, make them work in an operational uh, basis on both sides of the Atlantic. We're also joined by Maurice Fitzgerald. He's VP of Strategic Initiatives at Autonomy IM, Hewlett Packard, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from him as well. We are anticipating the arrival of uh, Giuseppe Conte, the professor of law at the University of Florence, and uh, who also brings uh, a perspective to stewardship and ethics uh, in the continuing evolution of uh, the data-driven economy. In terms of the capstone for uh, yesterday's discussion, you'll remember that, that we heard that, that this is part of the economy or a driver in the economy that both must scale up. And we heard from global corporations, uh, including Apple, Google, and Microsoft, that are working to serve their customers on both sides of the Atlantic. We were also reminded that here in this specific context, that it needs to scale small, where SMEs in this country could be as small as four people, literally mom and pop and a couple of kids. And they're a European average uh, of small enterprises being perhaps as small as, as nine. So those two, the, the large scale and the small scale, must meet, and uh, they can meet in the context of uh, what uh, one of the authors yesterday spoke to uh, of the app economy or this data-driven economy. There are new models and new measurements at play. In terms of data itself, it was described alternatively as live, dead, big, and wild. And we have to get our arms around all of those uh, to fully realize the potential in this big driven, the data-driven economy. And although the word was not invoked, the idea was yesterday around the stewardship of data, both public data and private data. And we will drill down on that in our time together this morning. And framing that part of this discussion was really the most difficult yesterday. Uh, privacy didn't exactly frame it to the liking of everyone. Data protection worked for half the room and not others. And then the, uh, there are also the suggestion of data management as a way to frame this. And there, there was no consensus by the end of the day. But what was interesting about the discussion yesterday is that it was, regardless of the label applied, or the label rejected, there was a sense that this is fundamentally important and it's being viewed as something much more than simply a, a compliance requirement, but something where there's a commitment to doing the right thing in the context of the environment that you're operating in. 
Yesterday, we also had a number of people invoke historic an analogies to help make sense of the big data economy. Uh, there were references as far back to the steam engine, early telephony, uh, also the, the succession of the automobile over the horse and buggy, buggy economy. We also talked about the governance of the internet and for something that is really 40, 45 years old, uh, it has seen a lot in its brief life and it has become institutionalized uh, in a way that uh, its relative youth uh, is a little surprising. And how is that sustained? How does that mature as more and more economic activity relies on the network of network? And I think that the internet's origins architecturally, and that being architected to withstand a nuclear blast, also provides us one other hook to a historical analogy. And at the dawn of the nuclear era, era, Robert Oppenheimer warned anybody who would listen, including the president, that we lacked the ethic for splitting the atom. And he argued that that was true in his time, and you could probably make the argument that it is still true in our time. One of the things that we want to unpack today in, in this panel is how we are doing with the, having the ethics for big data. And that is a global conversation that is more than a transatlantic conversation and one that I think is, is fundamentally important that we began to unpack yesterday and we'll spend a, a good part of our time together doing. So here we are at the opening of the era of big data. And uh, yesterday we, we set the, the stage. Today we, we can have a discussion about the responsibility of, of individual players. In, in this respect, it is the, the private sector's uh, role. And or it's, let's begin with you, where you have found yourself both early in the considerations of, of the ethics of big data. And, and for you, it isn't a theoretical or academic construct. It, it, it is part of every day. Welcome here. Thank you. I see Professor Conte has just arrived. So okay. We'll, we'll uh, <laughs> welcome him up uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as he's ready. So, so yes, I've been 27 years in the IT industry working first for digital equipment, which was uh, acquired by Compaq and then Compaq acquired by Hewlett Packard. About a year ago, HP, in quite a controversial move, acquired the UK company Autonomy, uh, which is a world leader in the, in the big data arena, in the analysis and interpretation and, and so on. And I'm sure some of you in uh, law firms uh, understand it quite well and are probably using it whether you, whether you know it or, or you don't. So you know, we've been hearing quite a lot about, uh, about privacy, about regulation and so on. Um, let's uh, welcome Professor Conte. Professor Conte, welcome here. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. Sorry. You know, what I'd like to talk about isn't so much the, directly the data privacy uh, regulations, um, but the ethics that are involved in the stewardship of big data. Now, I could be very linear and maybe Germanic and build up a, a strongly linear argument and draw to a conclusion, but I prefer to attack it a, a different way. So if you could put up the first side. Are there, how many Germans are in the audience? Stefan, okay, so only Stefan has any risk of really being offended here. Um, so what I've got here are three different uh, things that I've uh, translated from articles. So the, the links above are in German. So just have a quick look at that. Now what I'm trying to lead you through is a discussion about ethics, not about, well, you could, not about anything else here. Okay. 
here is this. What I'd like to draw your attention to is this statement, okay? Shaibele says that nobody, including him, could have a good feeling right, about what's going on here. And there's the, the third and final slide. I don't have any other, any other slides for you here. Right. So once you hear people talking about something that they're doing and they don't have a good feeling about it, you, you, you've got to ask yourself some questions. Do any of you write for The Economist? I'm sure you, you've done it at some points. So here's what The Economist said about this, just reading in a recent article. Um, Germany's highest court has said that data on stolen CDs may be used to prosecute tax sinners. Yet it sets a disturbing precedent of ends justifying means when those involve criminal theft. Undeniably, though, the approach is effective. Every time a stolen CD hits the headlines, more Germans with undeclared Swiss accounts panic and turn themselves in. Right? So let's just talk about you know, the, the ends justifying the means. Um, you know, when ethics are taught in philosophy classes, and they're sometimes, maybe not often enough, uh, taught in MBA classes, uh, one of the cases that's used is called the trolley case. It can be called the train case, the bus case. Does that ring a bell with any of you? So, one. So the trolley case works like this. There are variants. And I'd like, I'm going to be asking you to answer these questions. <laughs> You've got a tram. Oh, trolley, bus in old terms, whatever. A tram going down tracks downhill. There is no driver in the tram. There is no people in the tram. It's out of control. There are three people who an evil genius has tied to the tracks in front of the tram. If the tram keeps going straight ahead, those three people will be killed. That's a fact. Right in front of you, there is a lever for the Americans, a lever for other people. The, if you pull that lever, the tram will deviate from that track and it will go on to another track. There is only one person tied to the, that track. That person will definitely die if you pull the lever. There is no other choice than pulling the lever or not pulling the lever. How many of you will pull the lever? The majority of people will pull the lever or eventually do their email. So <laughs> the, then, of course, we add additional facts, right? And the facts are of a variation on, well, actually, the person on, who's tied to the track where you're going to run them over <coughs> is a member of your family. How many of you are still going to pull the lever if it's a member of your family that you like? <laughs> right? How many of you who pull the lever the first time are still going to pull it when it's a member of your family? Well, th that's exactly a good point, right? So actually, yes, the mem it's my daughter on this track here. But one of the three people on the other side has just discovered but not published a cure for all known forms of cancer. Right? So you know, the point is uh, it hasn't <laughs> no, they haven't Sorry. published it yet. <laughs> so but, you know, the point here is how do you know when you've got enough information to actually make a decision? And there are quite, um, uh, I think there are substantial cultural variations. Uh, one of my colleagues did that case in the, in, in the Stanford MBA class. Um, 
according to him, and I discussed it with him last week, everybody was for intervening, 100%. The greater good for the greater number. Uh, I did this in Switzerland. Nobody intervened. I, the conclusion was that there was no way to have enough information to make a decision, so therefore we were not going to make a decision and then we're not going to be responsible <coughs> for the outcomes because the events have already been set into play. So this whole, um, you know, I, I do have to say in, uh, in the fact, you know, I'm a Swiss citizen and an Irish citizen, so I'm kind of doubly neutral but somewhat biased. You know, Germany's uh, highest court there was talking about data that a French employee had stolen from the HSBC, which is not a Swiss bank, in, uh, in Geneva, and then has sold it in various places. Uh, uh, by the way, you can remove the, the slides. So the question here becomes, once you decide what line you're going to cross to be able to get the data, where, where does that stop? Uh, the same person sold the same set of data to um, the Greek government. Which I don't think we have any Greeks in the audience today. And I understand that the first half, because there were Greek government members allegedly who were on the list, the list got buried. Uh, a journalist resurrected it quite recently and then a, a politician who was on the list committed suicide. Um, because of the, you know, the consequences of what they, what they expected would happen. You know, but this happened in Geneva, the theft, but it could have happened in a variety of former British colonies. It could have happened in Delaware. It could have happened in a, you know, quite a lot of places that don't easily divulge uh, bank data. But let's move on to the situation of HP, who have, you know, like IBM, like other uh, companies that do outsourcing, uh, we are the stewards of vast amounts of customer data. In the specific case of autonomy, well, we've got the ability in what we call meaning-based computing to determine what all of that structured and unstructured data means in over 150 languages. So, um, you know, among other things, that's why the software is used in uh, 80 of the top 100 law firms uh, in the United States. That's why, where if you go back, I don't know how far, 15 years, all your law firms for the lawyers in the audience probably had armies of unpaid interns doing legal discovery work. You know, please go through this stack of documents and find any reference to these words, and you really don't have any idea what those words mean. Right? And you can't speak all that many languages, so we probably have to give the same stack to, to a bunch of other people. Um, you know, technology does that now. The interns scan everything in. Uh, our software analyzes the structured data, the unstructured data, the social media, the broadcast video and audio, and tells you what it means. These categories of structured and unstructured data are growing, and we discussed this, I, we believe they're growing at about 60% uh, annually rather than 30%. So it becomes um, you know, a problem, the scale of which humans can't deal with it. You need to apply technology to it. So on the positive side of the data stewardship, let's suppose we have a customer's data and we can use our software to tell them, hey, um, maybe in the, in the web content analysis, we were able to show you ways of improving your gross margin 20%. So do we have the right to, without that customer's authorization, go through their data to propose to them how to improve their business results? Personally, I think we don't, because among many other things, we can't be certain that their customers have given them the right even to give us the right to, uh, to go ahead and do that. You know, they're going to have to explicitly give, give us the right to do it. But that's kind of the, the positive part of it. If the software is used to analyze all of the data around, say, a, a major oil spill, 
or a big financial fraud. And then you know, we can see, if we're managing the data, perhaps that something that our client is maintaining in court they haven't done, well, that actually they probably have done it. You know, what are the ethics and what are our responsibilities in terms of denouncing that? In other words, <laughs> you know, what crime are we actually allowed to commit? from a data privacy law, from the, the, the perspective of the contract that we've signed with the customer. And I guess context is everything. For, for me, in that, those contexts of uh, something that might be criminal negligence some, uh, or big fraud, uh, we don't have the right to, to intervene. But like we were discussing today, context is everything. If the person if the company or the corporation is being accused of um, terrorism, of um, some sort of crime against humanity in a way, you know, and, somebody, and a government authority approaches us and says, we don't have time for a warrant, we don't have time for a court order, here's what's going on, intervene, tell us what's going on, give us the, give us the information. My first answer to that, and it's a tough one, is, was, well, you know, if Homeland Security came along or the equivalent British Authority or whatever, I'd say yes. But then I get to say, to thinking, hmm, okay, why do I think it's okay if, the, if Homeland Security wants it and not the Syrian government, right? The, the point is, I, because I can't, succeed in drawing a clear line on that you know, the list of countries that I believe are behaving ethically and the ones that aren't. I believe we can't cross that line at all. In any case, let, let, me, let me draw a couple of conclusions uh, before we go on to Laura. Are you... Oops. Ah, well, that explains that. <laughs> so, where do you want? Yeah. Here. Thank you. Fine, thank you. Um, so let me draw a couple of conclusions. You know, compliance is an increasingly sophisticated task, and it, it can provide people with a competitive advantage. It has to be done to protect the right of customers and the employees, and it's fundamental to establishing trust between between companies, trust and confidence between partners in any type of uh, commercial exchange. Uh, applying technology to it prevents the addition of costs to which would then be passed on to people. Um, however, keeping that burden under, under control requires a certain level of consistency in the regulatory environment, which is of course what the Commission is trying to do and you know, get one regulation instead of 27 or as close to that, and that just will lower the burden of, uh, on international companies to deal with this. Uh, I also feel that governments should do more to, uh, to promote and reward companies that can demonstrate compliance. By that I mean people who can prove that they've made the investments, whether it be in technology, in the processes, in the people, um, and the training. Uh, and perhaps they should have limits on the legal liability if one person in their system, you know, HP has 350,000 employees. I, I regret to say that not uh, all 350,000 are perfectly honest. If one of them screws up, you know, should the liability of HP or another large corporation be exactly the same as a corporation that has no processes, no certification, has done nothing to train the people? You know, I'd, I'd submit not. I'm sure that British Standard Institute, which does our ISO certification and other certification bodies are probably all over this and trying to work out how to provide some certification against um, the new regulations. And we'll certainly look at that really closely. Um, you know, but whatever the results of, uh, of that regulatory discussion, you know, the ethical debate will still remain. Oh, is deontology a word in English? I'm not, not sure. Is, um, 
I know it is in Italian as it is in French. Um, you know, we need a, a, a code of, of deontology that, uh, in our industry that says just what is it we're going to do. You know, is it okay to commit a crime to resolve another one? Is it okay to violate privacy without following the legal steps that are set out in the, in the Commission's framework or other frameworks? Personally, I, I think not. I also think, going back to where I started, sometimes courts get it wrong. You know, just what crimes are now authorized to track down tax frauds? You know, once the ethical line has been crossed, I respectfully submit there can be no limit. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. A, a provocative beginning, and uh, we want to go to the other side of the a, a Atlantic as we continue the conversation. And Laura, you and your colleagues at Intuit have been thinking with a different starting point and a different constituency in mind, but you've been thinking long and deeply about the issue of stewardship and corporate responsibility in this space. And talk to us about that, both its evolution and where it is now, and how it addresses some of the issues that have been on the table for the last day and a half. Sure. So I think it's important to start with a little bit about Intuit, uh, because uh, Intuit's a pretty unique company, uh, and we have the privilege of having some of the most sensitive data in the world, similar to banks and the like. So I'll talk a little bit. We're a 30-year-old company software company. We started out, uh, our founder founded the company with a piece of software called Quicken. Um, and that was aimed at managing your financial life, aimed at the consumer. Uh, over the 30 years we grew, we started serving small businesses with QuickBooks, which is accounting software. Uh, we grew from there with TurboTax, which is a, a software that manages uh, how do you file your taxes in the US for consumers. To that we added payments. Uh, online banking, and payroll. So over the years, I think the best way you can look at it is that we manage, help manage our customers' financial lives. We make that drudgery a lot easier. Uh, and you know, helping our customers, helping them save money, help them add value to their lives, improve the quality of their lives, has been something really important to Intuit over the years. But I think what's a little bit unique is that we started out as a product company, a desktop company. And what that means is the data for our customers was locked in their desktop. You owned it. You kept it. We didn't touch it. We didn't see it. Our value was simply the software, the application that we were providing. We couldn't add any additional insights. Flash forward 25 years. Over the last five years, what we've been doing is moving to the cloud. We've moved about 80% of our revenue from desktop to online. Moving from a product that we sell in a box that you keep on your desktop to hosting that critical, sensitive customer information in our cloud, really a financial cloud. Uh, and with that came what I think, and we talked a lot about it over yesterday, um, a very important responsibility for trust, building trust with our customers. And how do you do that? And it's interesting, as a lawyer, you know, you can start with, okay, what are the rules that I want to make sure everybody's following? But, uh, you know, we have a pretty brilliant CEO who said, uh, I don't want lawyers necessarily deciding this. I want it to be deep in our business. And so as that came about, what he decided to do was actually give me the responsibility for big data as well. So it requires me to have a split personality or be bipolar. I can argue with myself about what to do. Uh, but it also actually put the burden of that trust and, you know, into it's about 8,000 employees and making sure that trust was carried throughout the company. So rather than start with rules, I think that how we thought about it and I think that this is an important concept because it's more, it's less about Intuit and the more about that concept of trust. How do you build that? You start with the mindset. You start with how people think. How do they react? And to me, this is a pretty controversial statement when you talk to a lot of companies. 
but it's important for everybody at Intuit and it's important for people who manage their critical customer data to understand it's not their data. It is the customer's data. You are but stewards of that data. And if you have your company, if you have your employees understanding that and thinking that, behavior will follow. And that's much better behavior. So I think fundamentally, from a trust perspective, you have to buy that. And we all know that there's a lot of companies out there that don't think that way. Um, but we think that way, and I think that that's something that should prevail across the industry. So I think the other thing, and this is my split personality, what I have to understand is uh, not only do I have to help maintain that trust, but I also have to do it in an environment where I'm innovating for my customers. So the beauty of having data for your customers is not only are you just letting them use your software, but you're gaining insights into their behaviors. All of a sudden, you can serve up insights to your customers in a way that changes their lives, from saving money uh, to being able to understand how to spend your money better, to be able to understand what vendors you should choose, who's cheaper, who's not. Revolutionize really the way a business or a consumer behaves, and you can do that in a way by innovating. And for those of you who are in innovative companies, you understand that environment requires experimentation. And experimentation requires failure. The number one way to learn while you're innovating is to fail. So you really need to balance that, you know, the responsibility and that trust in a world of failure. And it's difficult. And that balance is really important. And we talked a lot about balance yesterday. And I want to talk about what I think that balance is. The balance isn't the balance between a corporation and a customer or a citizen. The balance is about the citizen or the business, the small business or the consumer. And that balance is between keeping your data safe and changing your life around innovation. The value that you get from that product, how do you balance those? What's more important to you? And you're the consumer. You're the one who votes with your feet. You're the one who makes that decision. And when you put the balance, and I think some of the regulators think this way, when you put the balance between a company, like Intuit or others, and the consumer, well, the consumer is going to win every single time. Because I don't think that you know, the, the companies or the corporations are actually all that uh, uh, sympathetic in this. I think the balance that we really need to think about is the balance that we have of improving a life and keeping that protection available. And I think that's something that you need to have a company really, really understand. So we talked a lot also yesterday about how data is contributing to growth. And I'm a firm believer. And I do believe that we are in the new industrial revolution of the 21st century around data. Uh, data can and will start revolutionizing lives. And that's data in your mobile applications. That's data in your everyday life. Um, it's going to change the way. It's going to fuel the economy. And we need to make sure that we're catching up, that these concepts are in the forefront of the regulators' minds. Because data is going to become critical. Customers will expect it. Those insights are changing their life, and we can't make them go away. And we need to strike that balance, and we need the regulators to understand that. Another aspect of growth, Michael and I were talking about this, that it's also spawning big data is certainly on the vendor side. Um, the innovation around building tools and storage around data is incredible. You have companies like Hadoop you know, absolutely coming in and wiping the concept of big storage from Oracle and others out, um, out of the question. And in addition to that, you have tools out there like Splunk. These are disrupted innovation and disruptive technologies that are really changing the way that we think about our IT structure, our infrastructure, and the like. So I think that that's really important, and that growth in the economy is critical. And I think companies need to be responsible to fuel that growth and then make sure 
that we're balancing that critical need in our customers. Um, what I like to think, and I think this is another idea to think about the responsibility and trust, is that I wish companies would not think about monetizing data. Because I actually don't think that that's what it's about. It's not about making money for the company about data. Companies should be obligated to think about data as their customers' data and improving their lives. And if they could do a good job of that, it's just like selling a product, revenue will come. If they do a bad job at that, it won't. And I, you know, I very much want companies to think that. And another constituency that I think is really important, and you mentioned it, uh, is the small business and how data can change the lives of small businesses. And um, we heard in Italy, average employees in small businesses, four employees. Uh, Britain is known as the nation of shopkeepers. Uh, small businesses are critical to the economy. And the use of data to help those small businesses almost makes it on par with the Walmarts or the P&Gs or you know, the big companies like IBM. It gives them insights into their business data that change their lives. Where should they choose their vendors? Where's the best place to get the critical capital to fund their operations? These insights are in the data. They're insights in their activities every day. And being able to help them do this is critical for small businesses. And we all know, and I think, that small businesses are the canary in the coal mine for the economy. They're also the bellwether of the economy. And if we can get out there and put the responsibility on our shoulders to help them, I think this is not just fueling economy with data per se, but it's getting the small businesses to help fuel and grow the economy as well. So I think that's critical. It's interesting, uh, at the end of the session yesterday, I was thinking to myself, what would I do if I were a regulator? And how would I think about it? Uh, because it's hard. Uh, I think some of the insights we were talking about around balancing are important and to really understand who are you balancing. Uh, but in addition to that, I have this idea. Um, wouldn't it be great if the regulators sat down with the innovators? The innovators at a company where they're impassioned about, this is about adding customer value and with my customer's data, understanding the environment that they lead, understanding that passion around it, and coming up with those guidelines to help them still move quickly, to still innovate for the customer, while making sure that the right rules were in place to maintain that trust and protection. And it's a constituency I don't think that they're aware of, and I don't think they see the passion. And I think there are companies out there, there are a lot of companies that think this way. And to me, those are the stakeholders, those are the standards that we should be setting. Those are the leaders in the industry. And I'm hoping companies will take that on, because the best way to regulate or to get the regulators to understand how to best keep this uh, economy stoked is to talk to the people who are actually doing it. And from there come the re regulation. Well, thank you very much. And in between you and Maurice, we, we have got a, a bookend for the discussion. And Professor Conte, we're very glad that you were able to join us. Uh, and and perhaps amplify some of what you've just heard and appreciate that you've come into the conversation colder than you might want have, uh, to have. But we also want to hear from you in terms of, of your work at the, the, and, and what you've been thinking and lecturing about at this intersection of, of ethics and, and growth and, and innovation. Welcome here, we look forward to your comments. Thank you and again, sorry for my late I appreciate very much uh, your point of view, your points of view. Maybe my point of view will be more boring because generally professors are very <laughs> boring. But uh, I, I will try to uh, fix a few notes. I, I took a few notes because uh, also my English is not my first language. And uh, I think uh, uh, we have to be very conscious of the importance of data-driven <coughs> activities and uh, this kind of economy. And in fact, uh, I saw that uh, also the topic of other ra uh, round tables of yesterday was about also to adjust the GDP uh, measures to also to uh, try to explain also and <coughs> to involve 
a broader quality of life uh, also within country to measure. And uh, of course, this kind of economy is important to measure the quality of life in, uh, in an economy. I think consumption data has not only uh, economic implications. That's uh, the first important thing. And uh, through this approach, we can also measure intangible factors that involve a wide measure of social uh, economic well-being. And that's why uh, it's important, I mean, uh, also to involve in our <coughs> statistical uh, analysis this kind of economy. The problem is, thank you, uh, thank you. The problem is uh, um, to regulate or not to regulate. And uh, if yes, uh, how to regulate? That's uh, the uh, key issue of uh, this uh, round table. We have to be conscious uh, at, uh, <coughs> uh, that the regulation is necessary to avoid that uh, the global context becomes a wild west, a, ter a territory where freedom of information or economic growth should be the same are the banners behind uh, which conceal every kind of violation <coughs> of human and fundamental rights that, that are involved, of course, in this area. The issue is what kind of regulation uh, to introduce uh, within a legal environment characterized by open and uh, easy access to everybody, traders, consumers, and also an economic environment characterized uh, by initiatives which daily flow across national borders. And it's not easy, of course, uh, to uh, introduce a regulation in this context. Uh, in a global context, we uh, experience that uh, it's more difficult to introduce uh, restraints, uh, restrictive uh, regulation, to ensure fairness and equity and protect all the subjects involved. The corporation mobility, we know very well. The corporation mobility, the difficulties to create a uniform legal environment in an in international context are two factors which have undermined the capacity of uh, nation states to regulate business activity. Law, we know law as a in a traditional way, law for us is a hard law. It means legislation, it means uh, statutes. But it doesn't work in this context. It doesn't work because uh, the jurisdiction of national legal systems is bounded by the principle of uh, extraterritoriality, limiting the capacity of states to project their domestic law abroad. The nation states have been involved, so also another problem that we study, in a regulatory competition. Each of them attempting to create an attractive investment climate by reducing regulatory burdens and restraints. You talk about Delaware and so on, on actual and potential investors. And this process uh, has been called, uh, and uh, is very uh, a fascinating expression, the race to the bottom. For those reasons, I think, uh, reasons, I think hard law legislation status is not the best instrument to govern the complexity frame offered by the global context. The state regulation of the economic risk to introduce so many restrictions and constraints, which undermine the competitive ability of the entrepreneurs, of the corporations, and sacrifice the market forces and discourage the investments. But which kind of regulation? The best uh, instrument, I think, uh, and solution to regulate this, this, this space, the global space, uh, and in particular, uh, data-driven economy 
is a combination for me, I think, from my perspective. A, a, a combination because uh, uh, between a soft law and hard law. A combination of when we say soft law, we say recommendations, guidelines, codes of conduct, and so on. Instrument of self-regulation like those, like uh, codes of conduct, are expression of uh, what I like to call flexible law. A kind of law which is not imposed by external, but is based on the agreements and uh, on the initiatives of the same corporation, the experts and traders were to respect it. This, uh, uh, the codes of conduct, uh, ethical codes, set out uh, a corporation's our understanding of its ethical obligations to its various shareholders. Uh, stakeholders, sorry. Shareholders, clients, customers, uh, uh, suppliers, employees, the public, and so on. Uh, codes, uh, code of conduct uh, or statement of values and principles contrib uh, contribute to underline best practice, useful to protect, if we analyze also the codes of conduct to protect human rights, to respect appropriate labor standards, to pursue environmental protection, and so on. I think uh, that they are the best instrument, but we have, of course, some problem. How to stimulate uh, entrepreneurs and traders to adopt instruments of soft law and to respect them? Generally, corporations, they uh, adopt, I think you can confirm, uh, codes of conduct because they want to improve they, their goodwill and increase their competitive ability and also to get uh, what we call uh, reputational advantage. They are stimulated to adopt them also by organizing, representing business interests at different levels. I work here in Italy with Confindustria, and we stimulated, Confindustria is the organization representing business uh, interests in Italy, and uh, of course, uh, they stimu are stimulated to adopt codes, codes of conduct at different le level, also at the small, uh, for the small business. That is a new frontier in this area. But, uh, they are also, corporations are also stimulated by, uh, to adopt them by legislative initiatives. And I think that if hard law can describe, can draw a framework of principle within then the soft instrument can come to introduce more detailed prescription should be the best combination that we can consider. We have also uh, experience of this kind of combination. There are many different all over the world. If we go to see and to check uh, what the different level of combination we can get. For example, a model of interaction between public and private is uh, in, US, in uh, USA, the provision uh, in the section uh, 406 of uh, that Sarbanes-Oxley uh, of uh, two, uh, 2002, it requires uh, each company registered within the Security Exchange, uh, Exchange Commission to disclose whether or not it has adopted a code of ethics for senior financial officers. It's a, a very light uh, uh, level of interaction, of course. Another model of interaction is uh, fixed, for example, in the Italian Personal Data Protection Code. It's very uh, full of restraints and constraints. And I understand that, that uh, it's a model that can have uh, uh, negative effects from uh, uh, some side. Uh, I'm talking about the legislative decree number uh, 196 
of uh, 2003. The section 12 is very interesting. It provides that the authority of privacy, guarantee we call, shall encourage the drawing up of codes of conduct and professional practice for specific sectors, uh, verify their compliance with laws and regulation by also taking account of the considerations made by the entity concerns and contribute to adoption, to adoption and, uh, of, of, and the compliance with such codes. I mean, uh, uh, it's interesting that legislator uh, give a space to the, uh, to the expert to uh, adopt codes of conduct to regulate their behaviors. Another model is drawn in the directive uh, of a European Parliament, for example, a European Union, directive number uh, 29 of 2005. It's a directive on unfair commercial practices. And uh, here is also just to, I'm going to conclude my. This directive uh, provides that uh, the ob objective of this uh, directive is to pu uh, purify the market, try to uh, exile of, uh, of, of the market all the unfair commercial practice, uh, misleading commercial practice and aggressive commercial practice. And, uh, 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 is very important, the Article 10, codes of conduct. Also, the uh, European legislators is conscious that it's not possible to impose, impose a, a very detailed legislation, prescription, in such areas if you want to get efficient solutions. Another... No, that's, uh, I mean, uh, the, the most important models. If I can say, of course, uh, uh, I am very favorable to ethical, ethical data uh, studio, uh, stewardship in uh, the internet age. I would suggest uh, that, uh, uh, I, would, I would suggest it uh, uh, as a principle-based code that is serious uh, in intent and commitment. Of course, uh, we have to understand that uh, if uh, doesn't uh, will be uh, if doesn't be enable uh, uh, hard law, the code is the only at the moment solution, and he has to uh, recipient a very important principle. For example. Corporations have to appoint a data controller that is competent to de uh, determine purposes and methods of the processing of personal data. Another principle. We have to under underline the principle that everyone has the right to protection of the personal data concerning uh, him, concerning their. Everybody has the right to be informed about the purposes and modalities of the processing for which the data are intended. And uh, of course, uh, the purposes uh, have to be specific, explicit, and legitimate. It's not possible to manage for all the kind, uh, all possible purposes uh, data, and so on. If you can work in this direction, I think we can have uh, efficient solutions, and maybe in this global context, uh, the protection of rights can work also without other solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I will say that here in a day and a half conference, you were the first to paraphrase William Shakespeare in terms of to regulate or not regulate, that being the question. <laughs> so we've heard three um, 
different takes on what the future looks like. The, the hybrid approach uh, that promises sufficient, both sufficient certainty and, um, and flexibility in a still nascent environment. Uh, we, I, I am, we want to welcome your, your questions next, but clearly interested in your reaction to, to Laura's proposition on behalf of Intuit of, of not monetizing data, whether that, whether that strikes you a, as a viable way forward. But uh, welcome your comments on that. But we have reserved time for your questions and uh, we'll take them now. And who would like to be first? We've got Stefan and uh, first up and, and a second waiting. So I have one quick comment and then a question. Um, in terms of big data, with all due respect to Maurice, whose point of view I like a great deal in general, I don't think it's a smart defense of big data, a, big, a good way of introducing ethical issues into big data on the tax evasion issue that you cited because it really asks a broader question of what the stewardship issue is when you have socially corrosive or cancerous data that you know. And I want to use that as a question um, to Laura. And I want to pull a Maurice on Laura, uh, an ethical question, because there, there is a great deal that one can agree with what you said about building trust and not really doing it through rules, because rules can always be circumvented, uh, which is part of the issue on tax evasion and so on again. And you, uh, and you talked about, with an unfavorable word, embedding it in behavior. What if, as you talked about the value proposition of Intuit now having a much greater deal of access to data, and you talked about, you know, more about data uh, and the financial economic implications, consequences for your customers uh, with the data in the cloud, if you find out that uh, that customer uh, that is not such a small business um, commits a massive case of tax evasion. What's the stewardship there then? Is that sort of in a black box because the customer is king? Or what do you do there? Which way do you switch the tram coming down the hill on that issue? Thank you. So I have an easy answer for you. I, I, and I'm not sure it's the tax evasion or perhaps more of a tax fraud. Uh, we actually part of an industry uh, that has been working with the US tax uh, agency, the IRS, uh, working together to figure out um, how as an industry we can help eliminate tax fraud. Uh, the industry has agreed, and these are all tax, you know, software tax preparers and the like, uh, to do certain reporting to the IRS, so using data to monitor and try to predict, if you will, um, tax fraud and report what we find uh, according to our algorithms and the like, um, what we believe is tax fraud. I, I think that it's not, um, I, you know, I, I don't think we are in a situation yet where we can analyze data and be able to pinpoint, okay, I know what you've done, I know it's a fraud. It's more of a predictive fraud type of analysis. Um, but we do indeed, as an industry, uh, rally around that. Um, and whereas it may not be fraud on our customers, it certainly is fraud on an industry that's near and dear uh, to, you know, certainly on the American side, you know, our fundamental values. Uh, I don't think it's perfect yet, and I think we all agree it's not perfect. And I think it's going to require a lot more ongoing partnership, which this industry understands and is committed to. Um, but we do participate in that. And I do think that there are times where, you know, we talk about customer trust, and if you think about an Intuit, uh, which may be different than some companies, similar to others, uh, we don't get a second chance if we lose that trust. And that's, you know, that's the type of information that we hold. Um, so we take that very seriously. And if you're a customer and you're wanting to do business with Intuit, 
and until it's not stepping up like the rest and helping the rest of the industry step up in a big problem like tax fraud where they're stealing identities from people and the like and filing taxes, would you trust that company? And so it does put an obligation to be what we call um, the gold standard. Uh, and, you know, and industries should think about that uh, because trust goes beyond just the, the social compact you have with your customer. It's your behavior. So. Good morning. My name is Claudio Lodici. I'm a, a teach prefer, uh, comparative government, so uh, I don't know much about the data-driven economy. Probably know more about vacuum cleaners and dishwashing machines. But I do perceive the importance of what it is today in uh, the globalized context. Um, I was just thinking to myself in terms of regulations that uh, it's not Shakespearean uh, say to regulate or not to regulate, but rather who's going to regulate? Because uh, uh, when I take a close look at that, it seems to me uh, everything is going global. You have mentioned transnational actors. And uh, uh, there is something to know for sure that nation states, states are no longer able to solve their problems on their own. Um, I was very much impressed by the example of the Swiss banker selling data, sensitive data. Because that's a case involving a national government and what we called transnational banks. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the 21st century is, is a matter of centralization and decentralization. You've got this tug of war where centralization means regulating or trying to regulate, and decentralization is what you see every day reading the papers uh, from ethnic conflicts uh, to uh, human rights abuses. Ironically, the data-driven economy, <laughs> software economy, high tech, is a factor of decentralization. If you think about it, it's pretty much uh, up to the individual and the decision that it, every individual is making every day and is, is in, in his or her life that the data-driven economy is pretty much up to. So uh, uh, perhaps you regard my comments as uh, uh, inappropriate, but uh, I, I'm still stuck with the original question. If we have to regulate, and this is going to be increasingly uh, a, a global environment economically, from my angle, in terms of governance, who's going to call the shots, if shots are to be called? Thank you very much. And Balance. excuse, apologies for my incompetence. <laughs> Who does it? That's a really good question. <laughs> you know, I think uh, you know, if it can be done in a federated way, the way the commission is trying to do it, covering multiple countries, that's already helpful. But you know, covering, getting some consistency among 27, working for transatlantic co cooperation to add the US and and Canada, or you can view who's adding who either way that you like, but to ensure some level of consistency, you know, helps. But in the mobile world, the, you know, the people who want to trick the system will, will move outside that framework, won't they? It's, so, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in uh, a multi-stakeholder process that companies hold themselves accountable. Um, which is why I think some of the mindsets and behaviors around, uh, you know, thinking of it not as monetizing data but actually providing value to your customer is very important because if you get those like minds uh, together, uh, I think that uh, together with, you know, the right stakeholders in the process, codes of conduct actually would come out. Um, where companies themselves are setting the rules within the context of how companies operate. 
um, in ways that can balance. Uh, you know, companies want to keep their customers. We don't want to lose the trust of our cu customers, and we want to add value. And we would be willing to be bound by conduct rules um, that we come up with together with other great ideas and leaders in the industry who deal with this every day and understand what could and could not go wrong. Um, I think it's important to understand no company wants something to go wrong when it comes to violating the trust of their customers. And so being able to do this from a context realistic perspective versus a rule um, kind of outside that context, so rules and regulations trying to apply consistently or not across many different industries with different value and the like, to me seems a far superior approach. And co codes of conduct have worked um, in a lot of different situations from board of directors codes of conduct to behavior codes of conduct for companies and the like. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, I think we, you know, I, I, I like that approach. Um, I think it takes listening and it takes the compromise and it takes the balance that we talked about into account. Um, but it requires responsibility and accountability by companies to come to the table. That works when it works, but let me push you just a little bit on that. What is the recourse when that model doesn't work? Well, you know, for Intuit, the, for example, the worst recourse would be we would lose our customers. And, you know, we lose trust with one of our customers. My guess is we lose trust with many of our customers. It doesn't happen to, ha happen to happen to you. It doesn't have to happen to you. Um, the fact that it can happen can be very unsettling, and they vote for their feet. So there is, there is an economic problem with it. Um, you know, there, there are also what happens when you don't follow your codes of conduct from a business perspective. There's usually a lot of ramifications from uh, violation of financial laws that are out there. You've got agencies like, um, you know, those that are governing both financial and, uh, and stock that can come in and help. You know, violating uh, something along the lines of data, um, you know, have implications from, uh, you know, I, I think you can be bound by your code of conduct, you can be bound to that activity, and you can also have consequences to the extent that something goes wrong. And you can have agencies monitor that um, pretty easily. Okay. Maurice, what, happen what, what happens when it doesn't work? Where's the recourse? I mean, uh, that's, that's just such a good question. I, I don't really have a great answer. I like the discussion around uh, in, a, in a business, when you're, whether you're selling to businesses or selling to, to consumers. You know, if it hasn't worked for your own company, yes, there is a decision maker, and they, they take their money away. You know, but more broadly, if the whole system doesn't work, you know, if the creation of a consistent set of regulations and a code of conduct across um, you know, what I'll geographically incorrectly call Western companies, because they might be Australian companies or whatever, you know, sign up to it, but a whole series of other economies um, don't, you know, does that create mobility into those by the people who have a desire you know, not to be behave by the, those same codes of conduct. So I always have a, a belief that uh, highly ethical practices will win out and that people will know which are the, the countries or regimes that are, that are hosting companies that, with whom it isn't safe to do business. And, then who can fix that and who can cure it when that behavior happens? You know, I'd, in my view, it's exactly the same discussion as who can fix corruption, right? You can observe it. You can have Transparency International publish a, lang a ranked list of it. You can let everybody know that it's going on. But hey, it seems to be getting worse. Is there somebody else who would like to be part of this conversation before we hand it back to Will and company? One more question, one more comment. The final word could belong to you. <laughs> By all means, Michael. Let me just add, 
and one more question for Laura on ethical data stewardship. Is this something you think of that there could be a common set of principles for all companies, or do you think that it would differ for different industries or different sub-industries? Is there a, is, is, you know, kind of, kind of, is it broad principles or is it more focused per, per sector? From my perspective, it's broad. I think it's a broad principle. Uh, I don't think it is. I think, you know, the fact that we're thinking about it and pushing ourselves to that standard has a lot to do um, with the sensitivity of the information that we host. Um, but I think it, you know, not only um, should it apply broadly, but if you think about it, it's not that hard of a standard to live up to. Uh, and, and certainly, if you have companies out there in the world of this type of economic growth that we're talking about and the value that we can have, uh, it, holding a company to that standard, I actually think will accelerate the growth versus decelerate, because it'll create confidence, and it'll create further you know, requirements about customers will say, yes, sign me up. I do want to save money. I do want that, because I know that you're going to hold my data in the right way um, and as mine. Uh, and so I want those insights you can provide, and I, I want to, in real time, see my life improve the quality of my life. OK. A final question, and Professor Conde, you'll be at a little bit of a disadvantage in the opening. I mentioned the, 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 the comparison to the dawn of the nuclear era where one of its chief developers asked the question openly where we're, whether we had the ethics for the nuclear era. And here at the beginning of the, uh, the big data era, whether we have the ethics for it. So I'll give you just a, a, a little bit of time to prepare, uh, but we'll, we'll begin over here with, with Laura. On that question, uh, your very brief assessment of how we are doing in developing the ethics for big data. How are we? <laughs> and, and, and speaking on behalf of, of a, a, a transatlantic uh, commercial interest. You know, um, I, I think that, uh, I, I think um, that we need to spend more time understanding what we're solving for. So I think this has been a data protection argument thus far. I think there are two different perspectives. We are at two different. There's the EU and there's the US. And I, you know, I think that it's very difficult to figure out how to monitor something that you're still experimenting with. I mean, we are so new in the world of big data. Every, you know, everybody thinks that this has been going on, but it's actually a pretty new um, industry. And sometimes thinking end to end on how to monitor a new industry is very, very difficult. And I think we're at different places. And so, you know, I think we, I think both sides need to come to the middle a little bit more. I think it's not just a data protection argument. It's, it's a how to fuel the economy and how to make people's lives better and protect at the same time. And unless you come at it from those two perspectives, uh, I, don't, I don't think we're going to be able to fuel this industry. Fair enough. Maurice, how are we doing? Well, you know, we, we we in the room are, are having the discussion, which is always a, a, a very good start. Um, and you know, certainly you know, there are people among you like, uh, like Michael, like others who write and have got a lot of influence, um, who've got influence with uh, governments and so on, and you know, who create who create or support the need for the codes of conduct for as you called it, what did you call it, the soft laws the, um, that accompany that and that to realize and understand that the, the hard laws need to cover all of the basics and that you can't regulate all of the stuff. And then, you know, like uh, Laura was saying, I, I think we can do codes of conduct that cover the entire industry, because it's not a single industry, if you like, that the users of, of big data and that we can agree to behave in a particular set of ways that 
that supplies those soft laws. I'm not aware of any serious work being done on it, are you? Professor Conte, the final word will belong to you in terms of your assessment uh, of how the collective we are doing in, in developing a, a, an ethic for, for big data. Just let me, let me say that uh, a, a big problem, and I think also it was a topic of uh, uh, discussion until now, is also the enforcement. The enforcement uh, of uh, uh, compliance with the provisions of uh, ethical uh, codes of conduct. Uh, this, of course, is a problem because uh, until now, if the corporation doesn't respect, I mean, there isn't uh, an enforcement, effective enforcement. But consider that uh, the most efficient enforcement until now is the negative effect with clients. Uh, we have uh, so many examples. Shell, Nike in uh, South uh, uh, Eastern Asia, uh, Big Pharma in Pretoria. We have uh, AXA, the French uh, insurance company. They was obliged to adopt codes of conduct because they were <coughs> losing clients in front of public opinion. And that's, I think, the reputational advantage is the, the most important thing to enforce ethics now in the business area. I don't think that uh, we can talk about ethics as in a symposium, philosophical symposium, because a businessman has to pursue <coughs> shareholder value. That's the, <laughs> the deal. That's the deal. Uh, they are to uh, push the profit for uh, corporations. If they don't do that, they cannot stay so long on the market. They don't do their own business. The problem is that uh, there is a, a different sensitivity uh, of the clients. So uh, corporations are obliged also to involve ethical uh, implications in their conduct. That's all. That's the final solution. And uh, if you uh, let me say, and I just finish with, uh, it's very interesting also the Companies Act 2006 of the uh, United Kingdom. Because uh, the, uh, the behavior of the directors to promote the success of the company is also to uh, consider a long-term perspective. And in this long-term perspective, of course, there is everything. The impact of the economic initiatives on the employees, on the uh, uh, stakeholders that is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, are uh, so many different actors that can stimulate to ethical behavior, to an ethical behavior. And, and I think that that is an excellent place to wrap the discussion early in the era of big data, but the responsibility to take the long view. Thank you very much. Your panel, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now the hard work begins for both Will and Michael to identify for us next steps and some preliminary conclusions. Will, Michael?
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me get your attention just to close things up. Uh, that was a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, a great way to end our conference uh, by looking at the ethical dimension of this, this uh, revolution in um, this economic revolution in digital commerce uh, and the data-driven economy. It's been a great day and a half. I really appreciate all of you coming uh, from many uh, far points uh, of the globe to uh, be with us today. Uh, back in 1984, William Gibson uh, introduced the idea of uh, the Internet, really, in a book called The Neuromancer, and uh, he defined it as a consensual hallucination. And now this co consensual hallucination, uh, as we've heard in the last day and a half, is a profoundly powerful catalyst for economic growth and social transformation. We probably haven't emphasized that uh, dimension enough over the last day and a half. Uh, but we are hoping that data-driven growth will become an engine for the economic revivals that we need to see in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and uh, we think it is a source of comparative advantage for the advanced uh, societies of the West, uh, particularly as we uh, find ourselves in competition with uh, different models of economic growth, the authoritarian capitalist model of the East, and particularly China, Lenin, market Leninist, or however you want to characterize that. Uh, but now is the time for open democratic societies to vindicate their model and, uh, and to press their advantages on uh, creativity and innovation. So uh, that, that's been the, the primary message that we take away from this, and I just want to say a few things that are going to uh, happen uh, as we conclude that uh, by way of a uh, uh, follow-up and uh, carrying the work onward, uh, first of all, we want to circulate, we want everybody to ease their privacy settings and allow us to circulate their email contact information so we can uh, continue to, to, to have a conversation by email. Uh, so we'll, unless anybody objects, we'll circulate your email contact information and we'll continue to do that. Um, and, uh, and, and to think about who we should add to this conversation as we go along. Uh, we're going to have a report on the conference uh, that uh, will capture the highlights, uh, you know, those uh, points of agreement and the areas that still need further debate and discussion, which are obviously many. And uh, the, uh, the capable Diana crew will help us uh, uh, develop that and we'll get that to you. We're going to uh, have, a, will this be webcast next week uh, in, in Washington? And finally, uh, uh, Michael and uh, Lindsay Lewis and Michael Mandel will be going to Brussels for follow-up meetings with uh, officials and industry friends there to, uh, to sort of digest uh, the conversation and uh, convey the gist of it to uh, various people in Brussels. And lastly, I just want to say, uh, you know, we hope that uh, you all will uh, continue to help and support PPI as we try in Washington to raise uh, political awareness, to build political support for pro-innovation uh, policies, uh, for intelligent regulatory policies that support a vibrant uh, ecosystem for innovation. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, get political actors to understand, uh, you know, what kind of policy framework is enabling of that sort of innovation and data-driven growth. So please help us as we struggle with the political forces in Washington to, to do that. So finally, uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thanks to uh, John Cabot University, Dr. Hagen. Thank you very much for being a very gracious host. Uh, thanks to the European Privacy Association, Pietro, for all of your help. Uh, thanks to the Guarini Institute uh, and SEPS and everyone else who helped put this show together. So thank you and to be continued.